All right, guys, we're back with the Expense Expert Roundtable. And uh, we're joined here with Ushi Schwartz, who's my co-host of the None of Your Business podcast. I'm so excited Ushi to be here with us. And uh, we actually officially have moved over our roundtable to Prime Source, making it an expert roundtable. And um, this is something that we're going to be doing every month. We're going to feature it. We're going to have vendors and operators. We're going to collaborate. We're going to challenge each other. We're going to make the topic of weight interesting. Herschel Friedman with Metro Enterprises is on as the director of operations. Herschel, you see so much, and we're going to jump into all those you know, nitty gritty and dirty messes that you see on a daily basis and how you keep it clean and proactively, et cetera. And uh, Nate is uh, with Allied and you guys specialize in medical waste and uh, shredding around the country. And one of the reasons why I asked Nate for you to be here is because last time we started talking about the smell of a building. We talked about ventilation within a room in terms of proper ventilation for uh, the building smelling properly at, and so on. Uh, this is Ushi's first time at the round table, but it's our second time doing it. And uh, I'm super excited because an expert round table pretty much means exactly what it sounds like. It's getting experts at a round table. Ushi, what's your thought? Well, first of all, Michael, thank you for bringing me on. I really appreciate it. I love doing these kinds of things. And I'm particularly excited about this round table because one of our guests here, Nate from Allied USA, uh, we know each other for approximately a year now, and it's actually a fascinating story how Nate and I met, and I want to share that with the viewers. I think that people can actually learn from something just in the in the story of how we met. As long as you don't force me to say how I met Herschel, <laughs> I'll gladly listen to how you met Nate. It's actually a pretty, uh, you know, it's a cool story, but more importantly, I think it really says a lot about Nate as an individual, and I think other people can take something away from this. So Nate, as you know, he does the shredding and the medical waste, and he's national. He's you know services the entire country. And he's still, as the president of the company, he's still out there always doing sales. He's still out there trying to grow his company together with his sales team, but he doesn't preclude himself from that. You know, he's out there hustling it. And he sent me a LinkedIn message one random day, he sent me a LinkedIn message, he heard about our company and he wanted to become in network with Prime Source. He wanted to see if we can get together and if we can have a discussion about how we could do business together. So I saw the message on LinkedIn and I, I watch my messages and I read them, but I don't respond to all of them or even some of them for the most part. And this one kind of, I read it and I said, okay, interesting. And I went about my business. The next day after he sent me his message, the next morning rather, uh, I got a call from one of our customers, and the customer told me that they were having a lot of issues with their medical waste hauler, and they were done. They already had too many issues, and they wanted me to find someone else immediately. They wanted me to bring another medical waste hauler that day within a few hours. And then it hit me. I remember, wait a second. There was somebody just last night who reached out to me on LinkedIn that he's a medical waste hauler. And he wants to see how we can do business with Prime Source and our members. And I said, this is a great opportunity. I said, this is the timing of this. I can't make it up. So I reached back out to Nate on LinkedIn and I said, Nate, you're in luck. I actually have an opportunity for you right now as we speak. If you can get to this facility within the hour and pick up their medical waste because their current provider didn't show up for you know a, a period of time, and it was already overflowing. If you could show up within an hour, the business is yours. And not only that, I will consider bringing you into Network with Prime Source, and you could potentially start servicing a lot of our other members as well. And I'll put them to the test to see how we can do it. Within 10 minutes, they replied to me on LinkedIn, I got it. I'm going to take care of it. Give me the information. Give me the facility address. I'm going to send somebody there right away. I called on my customer. I said, somebody's going to be by your facility within a few hours. We're getting somebody new to come and take care of your needs. And that's how we met. And sure enough, he serviced the building. And after that, I said, all right, Nate, you earned a meeting. Let's have a meeting to learn about you and about your business and your company. And we had a meeting the following week. It happens to be Nate and I. We hit it off pretty quickly. And I immediately knew that there was something different about how Nate operates the business and the sense of urgency that he had, just how hungry he was. Wow. And he was very, very persistent, but in a respectful way, like you always say. You know, it's okay to be aggressive. It's right. okay to pleasantly persistent. Pleasantly persistent. That's what he was. So, Nate, I mean, you know, this does say a lot about you, but where, where did this come from, this tenacity to just, you know, hustle after it and go after new business and 
Like you get up every morning and you have a drive to just grow and grow and grow. Where did this start from? This isn't something that you cultivated from day one. I imagine there's a history to this. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, great question. And uh, use LinkedIn. LinkedIn is great. Um, plug for LinkedIn. It's a great tool. Utilize all the tools that we have out there, right? As sometimes we rely on just the old school methodology, but use use all the tools. But no, I mean, in Michael, and, and look, I appreciate that issue and appreciate the kind words. Um, and Michael, you talked about the jersey. So I'm a big sports guy. Let's just, you know, I'll, I'll shoot you straight. I grew up playing hockey. Um, I grew up playing hockey since I was probably two, three, year, three years old. My dad put me on skates. My dad's Canadian. Um, I was born in Canada, but grew up in Southern California. So people also question, like, you, you were in Southern California? You played hockey? Like, how, how did that come about when I tell my That's dad? Yeah. Yeah. And so I played for the LA Junior Kings program, which was a, a great program. Grew up there. And then when I was 16, I moved away from home to play hockey in Canada. So I was 16 years old. Imagine that. Um, moved away from home to live with a family and play in, in kind of a semi-pro league. Herschel knows the league because uh, he's from Montreal. And uh, played up there for several years. And then uh, eventually I left and uh, I actually went and lived in Africa for two years and did some some work for my church out there, which was another thing that just stretched me. Um, it was it was an incredible experience. And then came home and gave up the hockey dream and, and, and moved on with life. But going back to the drive into ten- tenacity, of course, there's mornings we all wake up and we don't feel like we want to get after it. But um, I will go back to the roots of one, my, my dad is a, um, he, he's the hardest working guy I know. So let's, you know, I'll put it that way. A lot of that comes from my father and watching him. Um, he was a, he's a, a blue collar worker. He worked in essentially in construction. He worked on a heavy diesel machinery and fixing it. So, uh, he truly earned his paycheck and I saw him every single day, you know, getting after it and providing for our family. So I think that work ethic definitely comes there. And then sports, I think, um, Sports is a big part of it. I learned a lot of great things with sports and being amongst teams and discipline and hard work. And um, and we said this when we were together in Ohio at the healthcare conference out there, that um, when we hire a lot of people, we look at some of these things. And um, ironically, we hire a lot of athletes because of their experience and they've been through hard times and they've had to be disciplined. They've had to figure things out. Um, they've gotten yelled at by coaches and had to rebound and had hard times. And then they've also had wins, successes, and have to know how to deal with that. So um, yeah, I, I would tie a lot of that to sports and that upbringing that's helped me. And then going, you know, lastly, I think if you get away in business from your ethos of sales and marketing and growth, trust me, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of fires every single day that I'm dealing with as well. But if, if I get away uh, you know, as the president of the company from sales and marketing and growing and seeing how I can move the needle further in the company, um, we're going to stop growing. We're going to stop um, you know, taking the next step forward. So I try and lead in that. And I also just love being with our customers and hearing things and our prospects. And I learn a lot from those discussions. If I'm sitting back, I'm not going to have that perspective. So I want to be in the trenches. I have no problem going to, I jump on calls with our sales reps every day, all day. I tell them to tag me on every call, tag me on emails. I want to understand what's going on today, not eight years ago when we started and I was knocking doors back then. Um, so, um, you know, there's still a lot of day-to-day responsibilities I have to handle, but I'll always, um, be involved in that. I have to say, Nate, this is the first time I'm hearing this. Uh, she knows this already. So, uh, he's just nodding, but I'm super impressed. I was super impressed when I met you and I never really knew the story. I, I, I did know that your team is kind of like, you know, they're large and, you know, like they're ready to tackle. So I was wondering yeah. a little bit, Yeah, uh, you know, they're all like, you know, they have the similar type of style of just going after something. And um, and now I understand a little bit more about where it's from. I'm curious, by the way, you said a good plug on LinkedIn, which is I agree with you. Uh, timing is everything. Timing was everything on this one. So, yep. um, you know, did, did that happen to you often, uh, Nate, in terms of, you know, messaging people and then timing was everything and it just happened? Absolutely. And I train our sales team on that all the time that you have to be you have to be everywhere and utilize the tools. And LinkedIn is a fantastic tool. You guys do a great job of taking advantage of it. But a lot of times you don't get a response right away, but when you do, just be ready. And yeah, uh, and I, so, I absolutely love that. I do. I have to ask though, what was wrong with the facilities vendor that they needed a new vendor? I don't think you mentioned that. I'm just curious. Well, that particular vendor just wasn't showing up on their scheduled times. So if you're not showing up as frequently as you're supposed to, what happens is the bins start overflowing, and they have a compliance problem, and they can get. You know, it becomes an issue of liability for the facilities. So it's a big deal. You want to have somebody that's reliable, 
dependable that's actually going to show up on their on their actual schedule. So they weren't. They simply weren't. And that's Love one that. of the big things about what Allied USA does is you can count on them. They they come on time. They're there. They show up. And I think that's what was the difference. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, like I said earlier, it's it's not a problem until it is a problem. And when it is, it's a big problem. Yeah, yeah. And I, I absolutely loved what you said, Nate, which is you still consider yourself as somebody where you're no different than your sales reps. You're also out there doing the sales together with them. You're in the trenches with the sales reps. And I think that's a wonderful thing as a leader of a company or of uh, just, you know, even a sports franchise, a sports team. They want to see that your heart's in it. They want to see that you're part of the team and you're not just directing them what to do, but you're living it yourself and you believe in what you're telling them. What better way to lead by example? I think that's that's fantastic. I sometimes actually have to hold myself back when I'm on a call with a sales rep about not to jump in and to take over the meeting. I have to you know, sometimes pull myself back to, to let them do their thing because deep inside me, I still consider myself a sales rep as well. I love it. I absolutely relish being in in the sales world i think you know it's it's uh it's fun you get to meet new people all the time and you're providing a solution as a gratifying feeling to that when you're actually helping someone um so i think that i can totally agree with you um it's the heart and the pulse of a company and this is a wonderful forum it's not very often that you have in the same room an operator a vendor and a consultant all just talking to each other having exchanges i think that we can all learn a lot from this and I think people should do this more often. So this is a good opportunity. I'm happy that we're all here. Thank you, guys. Uh, so, Nate, I want to start with you, Nate. Uh, you are in the medical waste and shredding business. It's a certain part of a facility that happens. Uh, this is going on for, for a long time. And to some people, it might seem that you know medical waste or shredding, it's, it's not something that's talked about a lot. So people may not even be aware that every single skilled nursing facility requires to have a partner who handles their bio waste, their medical waste, and then also handles their shredding. Now, for those that are listening, what exactly does that mean, medical waste and shredding? What is it that a nursing home has happen in the home that requires somebody like you to come in there and to do medical waste and shredding? Can you give us a little bit of context, what that means and what it is exactly that you do, the service that you provide to your nursing homes? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that and appreciate teeing that up. So as you mentioned, our services are are required. They're regulated. Uh, a facility must have a, a licensed medical waste hauler, a contract with them that's going to come in and is going to service uh, various things within a facility. So you have sharps containers, uh, needles that are placed in a sharps containers, uh, razors that are placed in a sharps container. Sharps containers go in uh, designated containers, boxes. Um, soiled or, or bloodied linens go in there. And I have a list. And I mean, frankly, I'd like to kind of just walk through it because there's a lot of confusion in our space on what goes in a red bag and what doesn't. Uh, generally speaking, coming out of COVID, people like to overclassify um, biohazardous waste. There was a lot of panic. And so they just put everything in there. And, uh, and that not necessarily needs to be the case. And you end up overpaying for stuff that's not classified as medical waste or needs to even go in a red bag. And really, the distinguish where you distinguish what it is is any materials that are have been soaked or caked with blood outside of like a sharps container and we're we're jumping right into there guys um so you look at like paper towels you look at gowns um you look at gloves uh any of these items in a healthcare facility um that have had contact with blood or other potential infectious materials then would be deemed they need to go in a red bag um things that wouldn't would be like um IV bags, um, diapers, um, uh, disposable gowns that haven't had any contact with blood or, or, or infectious materials, they don't need to go in there. And a lot of times facilities overclassify them. So we're picking up red bags. It's a big part of our business. That's probably in the range of 70% of the waste is a red bag, biohazard. Everyone sees them in a facility. Um, secondly is pharmaceutical waste, which is a really growing sector within our space. Um, Drugs. So you have anything from your non-hazardous pharmaceutical waste to uh, your narcotics uh, and your hazardous, uh, you know, an item like a Coumadin in a, in a facility is a, a very uh, popular, you know, um, pharmaceutical that's used in a facility that we pick up a lot of in these facilities. So anything from 
bio waste to pharmaceutical waste to your hazardous waste. Um, our drivers are coming. They're dropping off containers. They're swapping them out. So what we do is we put you on an appropriate cadence, a frequency for pickups, and we come and we pick up that waste. And we could talk more about appropriate frequencies and so forth. Um, but that's really what we're doing every day and, and making sure that these facilities stay safe, clean, and compliant. And if we're doing yeah. that, we're doing our job. I love that. Uh, Nate, I have to jump straight to Herschel and ask you, Herschel, what's the story over there? Are the, are the people trained enough to put the proper items in the proper bags? Because when you're picking up those colored bags, they're much more expensive than the non-colored bags, right? So uh, what do you guys do internally in the operation side? Well, we, we do audit. We do occasional audits, and we do find items that do not belong in the uh, in the red bins. Um, yeah, within the state, any state boundaries and guidelines, you need to be a registered hauler. So there's haulers, and then there's treatment facilities, um, and there's that's kind of how we distinguish the space. So as a hauler, we're going to go and we're going to pick up the waste, and then we're going to take it to a facility where it's going the waste is going to get treated. What that means is, generally speaking, in the, in the U.S. today, it's going to get treated via an autoclave, a commercial autoclave facility. So waste is going to be put into this big capsule-looking uh, industrial container, and there, it's going to get um, it's going to get cooked. Essentially, is what it is. It's a combination of heat and and pressure and steam, and then it sits in there and it's deemed non-infectious after a period of time. And then after that, it's going to go into a compactor, and it's going to make its way to the landfill eventually. But it has to go through that rigorous treatment process in order to be able to go to the landfill. It can't go straight to the landfill. You know, I know a few. I know a few guys that um, went into the business of uh, getting rid of the excess drugs. You mentioned it a minute ago, Nate. Is that something new that you guys got into recently? Um, no, but I think there's just been more of a focus with a lot of the opioid crisis throughout the U.S. and 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 just issues with segregating drugs and understanding how to dispose of them. Um, we've ramped that business up, frankly. Um, and how we do that is really going into proper segregation. I think this is a, a good opportunity to talk about that. Herschel, you mentioned, um, you know, training and, and educating your staff. One of the things we like to do is we have material that we put up in a facility, we put up in a storage room that just helps uh, visually segregate. So, hey, this is pharmaceutical waste. It's going to go in a blue container. This is biohazardous waste. It's going to go into a red container and just make those distinguish, uh, you know, distinguish those colors very clearly and those waste streams. A lot of the problem is they get commingled and then you end up, you know, having challenges with that on the back end. Um, but no, we're, we're very much so catering to pharmaceutical waste and growing that business. It's a, it's a healthy business, a growth business, um, big part of our offering. Yeah, very cool. I actually think that that's a very big talking point, Nate. And Herschel, you you touched on it. You know, you used the word in-service. Um, education is everything. You know, there's a lot of companies, I'm sure, that can come down to your building and can provide a very similar service, right? A price and a product is what everybody can do. That's the easy part. The real question is the vendors, the suppliers that you have that are working with you in your buildings, what else are they doing to help impact your business in a positive way? Are they giving you tools? Are they giving you processes that can really help facilitate organization, best practices in the nursing home? To me, it sounds like one of the biggest challenges in this space would be waste, right? Not knowing what products to put into the right bins, what to send out as medical waste versus actual trash, which is a lot cheaper to dispose of. And if you're not managing that properly, that's where you're going to be spending your money. That's going to drive your spend up. So it's not just about bringing in a medical hauler and making sure that they're actually picking up the medical wastes. What are they doing to further the results and the outcomes in my nursing home to help manage that piece? Does that make sense, Social? Does that resonate with you? It does, but um, we do not depend on them for that. Others, they provide us just with the bins, the red bags, the labels. And the rest is up to us. Well, Nate, do you have actual services that you do provide to your nursing homes to further the education? Well, I think so, Nate, Nate just mentioned it. He said he put separate colored bins. That, does that not help you, Herschel, in your buildings? Let's say you're doing that on your own. 
we're just using the red bins. Nursing takes care of destroying it. Yeah. Like, uh, like that is done in a lot of places. But, Nate, it sounds like what your company is doing is excellent. Yeah. That I, we could use maybe. Let, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, <laughs> uh, no, just to expound on this, I think there's a couple of things. Um, and, Michael, you and I have talked about this previously. We understand you look on a totem pole and maybe our spend in a facility is less than others. Um, uh, and, and that's fine. We acknowledge that. We're fine with that. Um, but what I will say is it's it's low on the totem pole until it's not. And what that means is you have an employee that's not properly trained and doesn't dispose of the waste properly or doesn't segregate the waste properly or you don't keep your manifest in a facility. And what I mean by that is we have an offering that all of our manifests for every pickup. So backing up, every time we do a pickup, uh, there's a tracking document, a manifest that's filled out and it's signed off by the facility, which is really important. Uh, we keep those digitally, which is really um, nice. A facility can pull it up at any point in time. They can log in and pull up that manifest so that if the state's in the facility, uh, you know, in the building and they come in and they say, hey, we want to look at the past year of, of your receipts or your manifest. Uh, and to- they do. Yeah, they do. They they do. I, yeah, it's a it's a big it's a big issue because what happens is our phones start buzzing here and say we need our manifest we need our manifest and we say remember we give you the login and then we help them and we educate them on the login uh, but that's a huge thing because uh, otherwise there could be issues there could be write ups there could be dings there could be fines potentially down the road and so again it's not important until it is really important so we try to take a proactive approach with these things um, lastly on that we do have a compliance um, a, a director of compliance and. She makes uh, in-person visits to facilities when it's appropriate and it's necessary to help educate um, the facility and their staff on just how to properly segregate waste. Compliance is becoming more and more relevant today than ever. Uh, in the past, I think that was kind of the mentality, just throwing the red bin and going our way. Um, but there's a lot of new challenges that we're facing in, in, in compliance. And so we've invested, we've hired a team to help educate us and then help educate our customers on the best way to do that. Um, cause again, it's, uh, it's going to become a problem at some point and you want to be, um, be proactive rather than reactive there. Very interesting what you say, Nate, about the, um, the department of health. If they're requesting, um, for the paperwork and I don't provide it within five minutes, it sends a very bad, it's a bad impression and it's very important to have it ready right away. They have to wait a half an hour for anything. They just start digging. Yes. People start thinking within five minutes that they have it, it's done. It's good. Yeah. And the beauty of the online portal that we have is you can pull it up in probably 30 seconds, really, and, and right there and you show the inspector or you can email the report to the inspector directly. However, it's done. And our manifests are also emailed right after the service and email gets sent to whoever, you know, from your organization you want it to go to. It can go to multiple people. Uh, just so that they have a copy via email, and then it's also stored uh, online for them to call. Because again, when survey or the inspectors in the building, then it's a it's a fire drill, and so we want to we want to be there to support you. All right, very cool. Now let's talk about the shredding side of the business. I know that this is another thing that all nurses and homes have to contend with, and typically I find medical haulers are also doing in tandem the shredding it kind of goes hand in hand first of all how did that happen why is those two things lumped together like how did it happen that it got packaged medical waste and shredding and what is shredding what happens on the shredding side give us a little bit of insight into that nate yeah absolutely uh there's a lot of synergies with the business you look they're both service route based type businesses you're setting uh customers up with a, a specific frequency you're dropping containers off, you're picking containers up. So when you look at those businesses, they're very synergistic. There's a lot of similarities. And so, yeah, like you said, uh, probably three, four or five years ago, all of a sudden, uh, medical waste haulers start getting into document shredding and vice versa. Some of the shredding folks started to get into medical waste. Um, I will say medical waste license and registration is tougher to get than document shredding. Um, but essentially, you know, when you look at document shredding, you have this uh, patient information that's really, really crucial that this doesn't make it into the wrong hands. And so why document shredding and proper shredding and making sure that you use lock containers, making sure that there's a full chain of custody from when that document was generated to the time that it was uh, shredded and being able to have a proof of destruction 
is is really important. So you look at a facility. What we typically do is we look at their needs and we'll set up uh, containers. We have containers that look like uh, we call them consoles. They're like a cabinet and you can place uh, paper on the front of it or you have your large garbage can looking containers that you can roll around on wheels. Um, those are the standard two types of containers. And we set those up, set a facility up with four or five, six containers, however many they want, depending on the size of the facility, and then set them up on a, on a frequency. And we come out and we swap those out. And then that material, uh, we have a couple offerings. It can get shredded on site. So we have on site shredding trucks that can shred it right there. Um, or we have plant based shredding, um, to shred it on site typically is going to cost a little bit more. Um, or we can take it back to our plant. We can shred it there. Regardless, you're going to get a proof of destruction. The the official name is Certificate of Destruction or a COD, you'll hear a lot of times. And you keep those on file again for what Urschel's talking about, being able to prove that you're shredding your your information and it's not going to make its way, you know, into the street or uh, heaven forbid something like that happens. Uh, You know, you look at all the scams and uh, breaches nowadays. uh, it's, it's, It's a big topic. And so making sure that this stuff is handled properly um, and then it's a bundled play, right? It makes it easy. We want to we want to make it easy for a facility. So if they're just dealing with one vendor versus having multiple vendors, generally that's that's easier for them. They got a lot of other things to worry about, um, you know, staffing and other challenges that they're thinking about. So if we can take the medical waste and shredding and bundle it together and make their life easier, then all the better. I- I'm curious, Nate. You have facilities that do shredding on site. Why why would they have that need? Um. You know, a, a lot of our healthcare facilities, to be honest, don't. Um, right. But some of our larger ones, like hospitals, they do. Uh, so some of our hospitals do. Um, it, it just depends. So usually it's driven by like internal process and internal protocol. Um, their preference is to have folks even sometimes come out and watch the, the, the documents actually be shredded. So, oh, wow. Herschel, what do you guys do? We have a company um, that comes with their truck. And shreds it right there on their truck. Really? So you just spend more money to have it shredded on the spot. I guess that's a, a better way. Is that by design, Herschel? Or is that just how it's always been at the facility and you're not exactly sure why? They never made us that other offer. <laughs> <laughs> they gave you the premium package. That's right an interesting later. topic right there, by the way. You know, The vendor will take advantage of whatever they can. And, and, and you ha- it's on you to fig- it's on you to figure out, you know, the options available to you that yeah, they're frozen. Uh, we're frozen now. I can see you. All right. Yeah, so but I'm glad we're having this talk. Exactly. See, this is the point of this is to get educated and to learn. And, you know, who knows how many other facilities today are also doing shredding on site and don't even know that there's another option that's available yeah. to them. And yeah. This is a little bit suspect. You know, if you're the vendor and you're providing shredding services to a nursing home, and you know that they don't really need this service. They can technically send it out, and it would be half the price. Don't you think it's incumbent on that supplier vendor to out because they, they something? I don't know. Or should they just keep going until the customer brings if, it up? If a facility is ordering Heinz ketchup because the you know that's what's been ordered all these years, the distributor should tell them, oh, by the way, you're spending three times more money on ketchup when you shouldn't be. No, no I think that's different because that's a generic over a branded item. This is a, job. It's a preference to lower the quality over here. It's a preference. It's a compliance issue. It's a, if the vendor has like, it. Yeah. Well, what do I gain by having a tread in front of my building? I'm not standing there watching. Or it's. Well, what Nate just said is that some hospitals want it done on, on site, I guess, to be more. Here's, here's the barometer. If there's a guy like Nate, who now comes and meets Herschel on his own yeah, and says, uh, what are you doing for shredding? I'd love to earn your business. And Herschel tells him, I have this company. They're coming to my building. They're doing it on the spot. And, and, and Nate immediately says, whoa, 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 whoa. They're actually doing the shredding on premises. I could save you a lot of money. And Herschel immediately, I'm sure, is going to be interested. Sure. And then what's going to happen is Herschel's going to get upset at his current vendor and they're losing the business. They literally lost the business because they didn't do the right thing and they didn't secure it. And I think vendors need to be very careful about are they really, they should never feel complacent that they're going to keep the business. They have to earn the business every single day. Herschel, well, we? I agree. And I think you should work for Allied. Herschel, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's this passion that uh, Ushi, it's this passion and, and tenacity that Ushi brings every day. I feel very strongly about it. I and I, and I actually, I have to agree with him. 
I actually have to agree with them. You can't compare A to Z. There's a big difference in the cost. You know, uh, and I don't want to also paint a picture that the costs are dramatic. When we're looking at document shredding, the costs are usually smaller. But at the same time, look, if you can save money and do it, and you're still getting that certificate of destruction, which is very important, right. that's what matters. Um, then, then for you, Herschel, the liability gets transferred because then now you have that document stating that there's certificate, um, it's been destroyed. And, and by the facility standpoint, you're covered. Like if somebody's going to question you or, you know, audit you and say, hey, where are you sending your personal health information? Is it just being sent to the trash or to a shredder? You're going to say, hey, here's all my CODs for the last six months or the last year. Great. You're above board. You're compliant. Whether it's on site or whether it's done at a plant, you know, a couple of miles down the road. So um, now there are some savings. You know, are they dramatic? Not necessarily dramatic. But again, if you can save money, you can save money. Yeah. Uh, Nate, from the time you would pick up the shredding, bring it over to your plant, shred it, how long, what's the time difference that I would get the uh, COD? Good, great question. I, you know, Generally speaking, depends on, a little bit on the markets, but I'd say within 24 hours because what happens is those trucks are going to go back and that material is usually shredded the same day, if not first thing the next morning. Like it's not going to sit on a, on a plant floor for a long time, it's going to be shredded there, you know, essentially immediately. And then at that point, you're going to get a certificate. Of shred. So you, you, email, the, you email the certificate. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. You know, you guys are talking about the uh, destruction of products and, and seeing how it's being destroyed and so on. And it's reminding me, we spoke about waste a couple of minutes ago. Uh, it's reminding me that many facilities that I've visited have transparent bags. They have garbage bags that you can see through them. And, I've had this conversation with multiple operators and I've gotten two different uh, versions of an answer. One answer is we only use transparent bags because we want to see what's through them so we can make sure that we're in compliance. And the other answer is we never use transparent bags and we don't want to see the crap that goes on in our garbage bags. I'm curious, Herschel, from an operator standpoint, you know, talking about, you know, destructing, you know, destroying things, seeing things, whether it's there or not. What do you guys do in your facility when it comes to garbage bags? Okay, uh, clear bags. Clear bags. I was, I was going to stop with commercial, but I'm glad you did it. Huh? Not inclu including uh, food? Including food. So everything in your facility is clear? Unless it's very, very heavy duty. And right in the kitchen, in the kitchen, they use the heavy duty black bags. But on the floors, when they're cleaning up uh, the rooms, they're using the clear bags. And, and one of the reasons is, is we do see what's inside, and very often we're going to find linen. In the garbage, you know, people, they clean up, they use the linen, throw it in the garbage instead of the hampers, and we lose money that way. We lose. So, clear, we go to clear. Right, especially if you're, by the way, especially if you're in outsourcing your linen and laundry and you're paying rental fees per item, you're losing a lot of money when they throw it in. I've seen transparent bags in the dietary department as well, to be honest. I've seen it everywhere. So, it's interesting. Um, I don't know why in dietary, but it could be they're looking for uh, cups and... The right. Dishes. Exactly what it is, by the way. The di yeah, I think it was actually reminding me it was a facility that had an issue with the dishes being lost, right? And they were spending so much money a month, and they see on the report uh, that we provided to them that, hey, there's something wrong here. You're you're ordering too many dishes. Like, what's going on? That's not best practice. That's not average volume. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah. We find with the dishes, though. With the dishes, we... We do um, clean out every week, go into every resident room, the closets, the drawers, the residents like this, poor things, and we find that mostly uh, the dishes and that sounds like a that sounds like a best practice uh, moment, and that's something that I would like raise my glass to. You know, like how we have teachable moment. That's a best practice moment to have a weekly uh, clean out of all the resident rooms to find things that you know. Forget about forks, knives, and plates. Uh, Herschel, give me some stuff that you found in resident closets. Come on. Oh, like 12 remote controls? People are missing remote controls for the TVs all the time. There's nothing we can do about it. We try chaining them down. We, we find them. People like to borrow from other rooms. We find them in the drawers. A lot of hoarding going on in South Lake. There are certain residents are hoarders. And this is their list. We have a list of we have a list of all the orders. We go once a week to their room and do a clean out. Also, wow, 
You know, in a facility, there's always two things to look at is the expense management side is getting the best prices for the products that you're buying. And then there's the cost containment side, right? Which is really eliminating waste. It's managing the usage, the application of the products. One could argue that the cost containment side is much more pertinent, much more valuable than just expense management. Even if you're paying a little bit more than you should be for a service, for a product, it doesn't mean that you're actually going to be spending more money overall. It's very possible that by buying the better product, the higher quality, or having the company that's providing more tools and more services and more education, where they're helping you actually manage the processes in your buildings, they'll do a lot more good. And they'll actually drive your spend down versus your cost. I think spend is way more, is, it's not arbitrary, right? The cost always comes down to, is it expensive? Is it cheap? It's a yes or a no. But when it comes to the containment side, it's endless. It's endless. There's so much that you can do to really cut down. Are you seeing a lot of that, Herschel, on the cost containment side in your facilities where there's just people are bleeding waste and there's just so much is going on that can sometimes easily be prevented? Do you see anything on your side that you can bring out for the listeners here? Something that people should look out for that perhaps they're not noticing, but you know, you bring it up with the clear bag, like Michael is saying, with the clear bags to look. So you have the ability to look inside and easily identify if there's something going into that bag that shouldn't be, because that's waste, right? That's just one example of something on the cost containment side. Anything you can think of, Herschel, that helps on the cost containment side? I can tell you this. On, on certain things, we will spend we will spend money because we know in the long run we're saving. For example, the company that does repair work on our kitchen equipment, we could, we could find vendors, mechanics, technicians that will do it for a lot less. And that includes, by the way, the company that we use that for our elevators, the ma- elevator maintenance, the generator maintenance. We could go with companies that are a lot cheaper, but they're going to be down by us more often. We will use more exp- the vendors that will charge more because they're better vendors. I've I've found uh, many results uh, uh, driven result driven savings that have nothing to do with the price of the product and. Uh, Herschel's mentioning a very great, a really great example of paying more for a service where you don't have to call them down as much. I've seen things like, for example, in garbage bags, where you know it's just a matter of sizing your bags properly. I've seen a vendor go into a facility and do an audit on all the garbage cans and change out the garbage cans, spend a little more money one time as an investment, get the right sizing to the less expensive, more common garbage bag so that you're saving in the long run. You ever seen anything like that, guys, happen, Nate, Herschel? Yeah, we do have that issue. Um, housekeeping staff with porters find it easier to use the large garbage bags on the small garbage cans. It's easier to tie the knot around the, the rim. That is an issue. Right, so you can get it a little bit larger, but sometimes I've seen it like much larger where it's like you can literally double over. What about the challenge, you know, that I've seen with using a um, less of a micro bag. I, guys, I have to tell you a story that happened. I mean, this is a real story and um, it, it just popped into my head. It's when I was starting in business around uh, 20 years ago. I'll never forget this. We had a vendor and he was selling us garbage bags. And he 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 wanted to prove to us that he is a reliable vendor. And we kept telling him it's not just about the price. It's about the quality. It's about the service. And uh, he wanted to make an appointment with us. And he's like, look, I want to show your team. And at the time there was like six of us and um, he's like, I want to, I want to show you, you know, what kind of product I have, and because I manufacture it myself, he was very proud of that. And I'm going to come in and show you. So he comes into our conference room one day, and we're sitting all around, and he brings, he opens up a suitcase, like a mini suitcase, and he opens it up, and it was like, inside was something called a barometer tester or something like that, and it had like a top and a bottom and a scale and a thing, and. He, squeezed it. So he took out a garbage bag, very, very proudly, I I must add. And on the garbage bag box, it said, I'll never forget this, it said 14 microns. And then he takes the tester and he squeezes it onto the bag and boom, it comes up as 11.8. And he looks at us with the straightest face and he says, you see, mine is the closest to 14 from anyone in the industry. The closest. And we were like, Nobody, are you love. kidding me? He, he went on to explain to us that the FDA 
allows you to say 100% of juice when it's a certain percentage less. It allows you to like market it as 100% juice as long as you have 98.9%. So he was educating us and saying to us, look, you can look at me as I'm a thief or you could look at me as I'm the most honest thief. And this is what he told us. And we learned a lot about that lesson that day of understanding what a person means when they say the size or the quality. And then what we went on with our journey is we found that many facilities, Herschel, tell me, tell us if this makes sense, double up on garbage bags, regardless of how many times you train them that you only need one. So I've seen facilities that order 10 microns or you know even less where it's such a low quality and I ask them, what are you doing? Why are you spending so much on garbage bags? And they say, we'll never be able to train our maintenance people. They're always going to double up. We, we see the same thing on the biohazard side. We see people that want to double bag all the time for the on the biohazard side. Um, it's common and, and it's it's not necessary. Um, I think a lot of it does come, it stems though coming out of the pandemic, um, this kind of fear-based segregation, supply management, like overcompensating type of mentality. And we saw it a lot during that time. Now, I will add, there was probably some time there that made sense to do that. But right now, it's not necessary. We do see it. Um, yeah, we see all kinds of crazy things, but definitely um, see the double bagging. And the liners that we put in these bags, um, you don't need to. You can use, use one. And um, and supplies are important. Making sure that a facility has the proper supplies and proper, because we get this all the time. Hey, we ran out of boxes. We ran out of bags, which is okay. We can overnight them. We can get them to you tomorrow. Um, but we always say, like, we'd rather put additional supplies in your facility um, and make sure that you're prepared for that time, that rainy day, versus saying, oh, my gosh, I have no red bags. I have no boxes. I don't know where I'm going to put my sharps containers. And it's like, we, we, we've said this. We've gone through this. And so we can educate. Of course, it comes down to the generator or the facility to be able to properly manage that. Um, but supply management is huge, especially in our space as well, because when you don't have somewhere to put your biohazard waste, it's a pro- it's a big problem. Obviously. Of course, of course. Herschel, um, what what are, what are your thoughts about what I was saying about doubling up bags? Well, there's one advantage to doubling up if you have quality bags. That when um, the bag when the trash can is full, housekeeping takes out one bag, saves time, doesn't have to reline it because we empty twice. In, in closing, Herschel, I would like to just finalize and ask you, was there a product or a service that you've seen recently in, in this category of building service maintenance and safety, et cetera, that was like, wow, that was something that was interesting for me to learn, or I did things a little bit differently, and now I'm saving money because I'm spending more money? Switching to LED lighting. Cool. What that what did that do for you guys? First of all, we don't have to change the bulbs that often. We were having an issue that every time we tested the generator, a lot of the lights were uh, we had to replace the bulbs. Um, the LEDs they just last longer and they're actually nicer, and they cost less to run on a monthly yeah. basis. And and there was an initial cost, I'm assuming, with installing the whole system and yeah. the bulb. Right. Okay. Cool. Love that. Love that. Uh, I'll just tell you one story. I just wanted to regarding uh, solid waste. They wouldn't appreciate this. So we have five, East Haven has five two-yard containers outside, and the garbage gets thrown in the, the, the uh, solid waste. It was always, you know, we always had a problem at the end of the day or the weekend, and it was overflowing. Suddenly, one month, I noticed it was never getting filled. No matter what, I'd go outside, come in the morning, it wasn't, it was, we were never, it was never filled up. And it kept on going on, and we figured it out at the end of the month when we got a bill. A second vendor, which we didn't sign a contract with, was showing up every night. Huh. So we had the day guy, and we had the night guy. We didn't know about it. We didn't, you know, the front desk has them the keys, thinking, okay, pick up the trash. But then, and then we got a bill. It was another vendor just trying to move in. Huh. Oh, that's one way to yeah. do it, yes, right? Just to... Uh, so the rumors are true. The waste business are run by classy guys. Yeah. <laughs> 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 thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Herschel. Thank you so much, Nate, thank for joining you. us. Uh, we look forward thank to you. Uh, to connecting the two of you and uh, to continued growth. And uh, like you mentioned earlier, 
Uh, Nate, sales, marketing, and growth is what we're all about in terms of this roundtable. So we appreciate everyone's time today and wishing you a happy holidays and a great week. Thank you so much. Do well.